Um, so hello everyone, um, my name is Antoine Vergne. I am working at uh, Mission Public, and um, we are working on citizen participation. It's um, my pleasure today to be uh, with Rashi and Roberto in that uh, town hall to talk about um, citizens' engagement and artificial intelligence uh, and the future of it. Um, so maybe Rashi, you want to, to say a word on yourself and Roberto too? And then we can um, give you some input, um, and then we will have a, a discussion, and then we can try to understand what could be the next step of such of such an initiative. Thank you, Antoine. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rashi Saxena. I'm from Bangalore, India. Um, I uh, was deeply involved in organizing uh, the Global Dialogue back in 2020 uh, on behalf of my country in India. Um, I'm also uh, a member of the scientific committee uh, for the We the Internet project, which we will be discussing further. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here. And I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Roberto. Thank you very much, Rashi. I want to welcome as well to all the attendants to this session. Uh, it's going to be very insightful. My name is Roberto Zambrana. I, I come from Bolivia. I was also involved in the dialogue in, in, in Bolivia couple of years ago, and uh, happy also to be part of the Scientific Commission uh, Committee of uh, With the Internet Initiative. And uh, well, with that, I think we can go. Yes, uh, moving on to you, uh, Antoine. Yes, so maybe, Roberto, you can, you can share your screen, and so we can, we can have the, the kind of short presentation on looking back um, at what we've done together. Um, and then looking ahead at what we could do together. Um, so it's about the global dialogue on AI and metaverses. Maybe you can put the next slide. So that was for the program today. Um, and we can start uh, with a short icebreaker. That's always a, a nice way to get together. Um, and maybe we can think about next question. That question is if you were able to ask an artificial intelli general intelligence or something very, very advanced, one question. What uh, would that question be? Maybe we can take 10, 15 seconds, and some of you in the room want to, to share with us or online what that question would be. So think about it. You, you are in front of a general uh, artificial intelligence, and you can ask one question, you know, a bit the kind of, uh, for those who know, uh, the HS, HS Guide to the Galaxies, that question to the deep mind. You're, you're in front of DeepMind and you can ask one, one question. What would that question be? Anyone would like to contribute Volunteer. with that? You want? Sure, sure. We have one here in front. OK, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Jane Mananiso, a member of parliament from South Africa. I am part of the ICT group in parliament, and as well, I'm the whip of Department of Higher Education and Training, Science, Innovation, and Technology. Uh, one of my worries with regards to anything that has to do with ICT and AI, it's the issue of uh, forever perpetual inequalities in terms of those who are at the peri rurals and as well those who are illiterate. So I want to ask AI, what is it that we can do to make sure that we bring everybody along in terms of the advancement and transformation of a uh, for IR? Be it AR, be it cyber security, cyber crime, and everything that has to do with human rights. What is it that we can do? globally to ensure that we bring everybody along. And as we grow our countries and the world, we grow with everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very interesting question. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Is there anyone so else that would like we, to go? We have one question from Philippa, which is, uh, can I trust you? So that would be the, the question that Philippa would ask, <laughs> <laughs> would be the trust question. Uh, can I trust you? Um, other questions in the room? We have a mic there as well, you want to talk, or we can just pass the microphone. Absolutely. Rashi, what would you ask? Thank you very much. Um, good, 
good afternoon. Um, I'm Amy Tsudaka from Japan. I am working at a company called Osin Osin Tech. We use Osin. Uh, uh, we collect um, a lot of governmental uh, press release release in different languages into one language using AI, um, and and we are trying to offer uh, customers to. Um, um, more official and re reliable information in uh, English, yes. And uh, my question and my um, like uh, my what do you say like question <laughs> is that um, when when you say design, uh, let's design the next global dialogue on AI and metaverses. And designing is very very tricky. You know, if we try uh, try to avoid um, a lot of problems. And, but if we hesitate to move forward, we cannot <laughs> move forward. So um, I would like to um, know the way you think about the balance of uh, preventing the uh, preventing problems, but going move forward to have better world. Um, so that's my question. That's the balance the between threats and, and how we need to advance. Exactly. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That is a very valid question, given all of the Gen AI tools that we have and uh, the concerns around uh, the misinformation aspects of it, whether it comes to uh, information being outdated or um, having faulty information that could have reputational harms to uh, gender-based violence harms with um, the advent of, um, I would say, revolutionizing and democratizing um, doctor videos. So yes, that's a very relevant question uh, to include in our dialogues. Yes. <laughs> Any other question, maybe? Someone else like? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I am a high school teacher at a high school called Jiugaoka Gakuen in Tokyo. And I've been trying to develop metaverse with help of AI and want to teach international students take the social emotional skill lesson. And we are now trying to develop such kind of a curriculum. But now I'm only using the uh, standard uh, meeting system. And I wonder how we can ask support from, for the AI developers or the metaverse researchers. And we, as a teacher, we need to use those latest technologies so that international students can collaborate together. But we don't know how to ask for help to people in those research areas. So if you have a suggestion. I would like to collaborate with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if we have a solution, but we could ask the general AI to give, to give us one. That would be one question to ask. <laughs> uh, Rashi, Roberto, what, what would you ask that? Uh, well, that I think <laughs> I will ask uh, the AI what the AI think of itself. Yes, I think I would ask the same. I would ask the same. From a curriculum perspective, um, the Indian government in their AI strategy has uh, initiated something with, um, with I believe, with Intel. It's called the AI for All. So basically, it's building curriculum for school students in the central school board to give them education around that. Um, and the Indian government also came in partnership with startup incubators to start podcasts and conversations around simpler concepts of AI. So I'm happy to connect offline and maybe that's of interest to you. Um, but yes, um, there's also, Antoine, we could also share the metaverse uh, curriculum or rather the AI curriculum that we had with the dialogue. We're happy yes. to share that as well yeah. with you to keep the conversation going. Thank you very much. Yeah, very that's good. Very so then maybe thanks, Rashi, for the transition. Maybe it's time to, to look back at what we've done together in 2020. 
and maybe Roberto, you can show us the next slide. Sure. So here, the the idea what we could uh, what we would like to do is have a, a look back at a project we did together, um, with many other partners. So on the left side, we were the strategic partners. On the right side, we were the strategic partners too, but in the countries, <laughs> and on the left side, the the strategic partners at a global level, um, and we formed a coalition um, and we de did the design. So one of the questions were, how do you do the design? And we can talk about that um, later. We did the design and the implementation of what we called a global citizens dialogue. So what it is, maybe um, Roberto, the next slide. Um, the principle is pretty easy, uh, is we um, take as many countries as possible over the world, all, all around the world, and in each of those countries, we select a group of uh, citizens, ordinary citizens, citizens that are non-engaged, non-expert, but are selected through random selection or through a system of snowballing to have um, a group which is representative of the diversity of its country. Uh, so very important is non-expert, non-engaged. These are what we call day-to-day -day citizens, everyday citizens, ordinary citizens, lay citizens, whatever you want to call them, these are people that live in the country and have an experience of the internet or not, because in some of the countries, we of course also have people without internet connection. Very important too. And um, we gather them for one day uh, of dialogue, and that day is normally one day all over the world, and they go through different topics, and for each of the topics, they get information. So we were talking about the curriculum, so it's a very short curriculum in that case, but it's about the main information on a topic, uh, the main controversies on a topic, and then they discuss on that topic through one or two questions. And those questions guide that discussion, and then at the end they give a collective answer to that question. So here you see the gender balance of our participants um, in 2020, so we had around um, almost 6,000 participants all over the world. And as you can see, we had a very good distribution of ages, good distribution of gender. And maybe on the next slide, you also see the distribution in terms of occupation, um, which more or less reflects the global population. So that's, that was for us a check to see, okay, what we had in those rooms, those almost 80 rooms, almost half of them virtual, because it was 2020, so it was in the height of the pandemic, uh, but half of those dialogues were on site um, in, um, yeah, how to say, in face to face meetings. So this, these are for the demographics. Um, one of the sessions we had, one of the topics was governing artificial intelligence. Um, and we asked the citizens to take a couple of positions and to discuss and collectively to, to give their opinion on the govern, uh, governance of artificial intelligence. One remark on that, it's always what you will see after, it's always the what we call the collective judgment. It's not only the individual opinion, but some of the results are also the results of the discussion of the groups. And that's very important for us because we don't want uh, an opinion poll we want uh, to understand what people think when they think. It's a kind of a, a advanced way of asking the, the people on complex topics. So, and one of the questions we ask, and I'm sorry for the numbers below because normally it should be 0, 10, 20, 30, but it's, there was a, <laughs> a glitch in the numbers. So it's percentage. Um, we one of the things we asked the group was to reflect on if they thought that artificial intelligence was more a threat or an opportunity or equally. And as you say, at the end of the day, when they had discussed, um, the people said, okay, it's equally an opportunity and a threat, almost half of the groups. And on top of that, um, a couple of, um, around 30% of the groups also felt that it was more an opportunity than a threat. So the, the first results we had was that generally, people didn't see AI as something very, very bad in itself. Um, and it was, rather a neutral or positive view on artificial intelligence. So next slide. Then we ask them, um, and that's the, the big advantage of such dialogues, is that you can have qualitative work. So we ask them to um, 
work on the priorities and which, which, can, which should be the priorities um, in developing AI systems and AI governance. And as you can see, it was the most, the, the highest one was it should be aligned with uh, human rights. And um, then we asked them some uh, questions with, which were uh, closed questions. So that's more individual questions in, in that sense. And here you can see also about the question of ethic and AI. Um, and they had the feeling that, of course, there should be uh, ethicists uh, involved in all that work uh, in all of the um, different organizations. Maybe the next one. And that is hard to read, but just I wanted to, to give you the general impression of that. On that question, we asked the people to um, tell us as a group if, it were, if they saw more an opportunity or threat in different fields of AI. The last one is where the people had the impression that it would bring the most opportunity and that research and um, development, science and research. They saw that it was one of the fields where it, they, it would bring a lot of opportunities and not a lot of threat. And um, also to explain all those uh, sentences on the left that I'm sorry are not really readable, but I can give you, for example, the, the last one, where a uh, dilemma. And that's what we work when we do, and because we are going to discuss about what could be a, a cycle, a, a new dialogue on that topic, is it's very important in those dialogues to phrase uh, controversies or dilemmas, because we all know when it's about um, to uh, create public policy, to take decisions together, collective decisions, very uh, often what we have is to solve trade-offs, to solve dilemmas, to solve trade-offs. And that's when those deliberative processes, those citizens' dialogues, work very well. So if I take the last one, for example, uh, or maybe, Roberto, you can stay on the one before. Um, can you? Yeah. No? No? Yes. So the last sentence, um, AI brings advances in science and research that are not worth the huge investment needed we should invest the, the money elsewhere. So that's on the left. And on the right, AI brings a lot of breakthrough in science and research, uh, and with, which benefit humanity. So and you see on all, each of those lines, you, you had a, a controversy or a dilemma, and they had to choose. And for example, the, the first one, uh, where the people thought the most harm would come, is that I use is, directly, is directed by those who want to get profit, profit and exercise power, that is the left part, or data is used um, and organized for the common good and serves humanity. Here you see that the people all over the world had a more um, negative view on the use of data and how it would be done. So maybe next slide. Um, then we also asked, uh, asked, of course, the citizens to who should take decisions, uh, governance, <laughs> who should governance be done? And we are at the Internet Governance Forum, so uh, it's interesting to see uh, that for, for AI, uh, there was a very big um, part of the citizens that wanted to have a um, global level uh, discussion and a global level governance for AI more than on other topics. And maybe you can show the next one. Okay, so maybe we can stop here. Um, we can go one back. And maybe Rashi, uh, Roberto, and I see that we also have Desiree online. Want to add something on, on that experience in 2020? Maybe we can give a chance to our colleagues online. Yes, okay. we invite anyone in online. If I, if we have Juliana, then I'm recognizing. Ah, yes, we also have Juliana, yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Juliana from Indonesia. Happy to meet all the participants to interesting in AI and global dialogue organized by Mission, by Mission Public. I think what Antoine's presentation is quite clear about the, what the global dialogue on internet is happen. Uh, from my experience from 2020, is this is a uh, it is uh, nice to hear, sharing the knowledge, sharing the experience about the, what the internet, digital technology, and especially about AI 
in this conversation from different stakeholders from different country and different background because I know is that the digital technology is uh, help people in different ways and everybody in different uh, stakeholder different country different economic uh, economic uh, so uh, economic situation is has different different experience about the digital technology and especially AI then I think what the different experience will bring to the uh, inclusion policy and inclusion uh, inclusion what is it the uh, best practice for what what we should do to 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 have the better of uh, the better apply, apply application of AI in our life I think it's, it's enough for me Antoine thanks Juliana so I'd say um Roberto Rashi, if you want to add something, but then after I can show a second example of a citizen's dialogue on, on a related topic, and then we can open the discussion. I wanted to check if Noah is online. I'm not sure if Noah is online. Or anyone else that would like to share with us? Okay, so maybe um, Roberto, you can share again the, the presentation. I can I can do the second part of the input. Sure. So in here, I will I will share another experience. Uh, this time, it was uh, more done by Mission Public and, and less by the coalition, uh, but it's in a way it's a direct. Um, it's a child <laughs> of, that, of that dialogue uh, and, uh, and of developments in, in Europe around citizen participation. And these were the European citizens panels. Um, maybe you can show the next slide. So the, the context um, in um, 21 and 22, we had in, in Europe um, a, a huge process, which was called the Conference on the Future of Europe. And this conference was launched by the European Parliament uh, the European Commission and the Council, and it was about asking citizens of Europe about their views and wishes uh, and recommendations for the future of Europe. And this process was um, both at national and European level. It was both online and on site. And one of the key uh, pieces of um, that process were so-called European citizens panels. And those panels worked on the same principle as the dialogue with the internet meaning we had a group of randomly selected Europeans coming from all EU countries and um, representing the diversity of Europe, uh, each talking their own language. But that process was a bit different because it was not one day, it was three weekends, so a, a much deeper process of discussion, uh, but, but with a sm smaller group of people because it was 200 in each citizen's panel. And in 22-23, we had a new cycle of those panels with three topics, uh, which were policies being prepared by the European Commission. The first topic was food waste, um, because the Commission was preparing a directive on food waste. The third topic uh, was learning mobilities, so the fact that you go abroad to learn and go back to your country, because the European Commission was preparing um, a text uh, on it, a program. And the second, you see it, it was about virtual worlds because the Commission was preparing a non-legislative uh, text, uh, an initiative uh, on virtual worlds. Maybe you can show the, the next slide. So the next, so, the, so yes, for, uh, basic facts, we had 150 randomly selected citizens with stratification from all over the, the countries in Europe, three weekends, um, and um, we, we had those citizens discuss with another, so it's the photo you see on the links, um, and on the left side, maybe you can show the next slide, um, Roberto. Actually, um, in so between that, Antoine, Desri wanted to make a few comments. Yes. Uh, if Desri is still online. Yeah. Hi. I think we should... 
Uh, yes, uh, this is Desiree Milosevic um, Evans. I uh, wanted to make a few comments um, earlier on, on on the findings that you have presented in 2022. I believe that it's um, very important, first of all, the work that uh, Mission Public is doing, and that's why we like to get engaged, to get out uh, to the people who are otherwise not really close to the process of either national IGF or the global IGF. And this is not one of their first priorities to think about. So from the point of um, concept, I, I really always l liked um, how Mission Public tries to reach out to vulnerability um, se uh, section of population, but also of um, unions of workers that are going to be really um, somehow affected by all the policies that we are discussing here. Um, the, um, when you pointed out um, that uh, some of them wanted regulation on a global level versus like regional level, um, I think it would have been also good to tease out like the motif as to how, why these deliberations happened that way. And if you <laughs> could possibly somehow also quantify, you know, to understand a little bit uh, the thinking uh, behind it, I would um, personally find that useful. Of course, moderators that um, do it uh, at the time of speaking to the groups uh, really know, but I wonder in future it's um, how we could present it a little bit, you know, more uh, grained. And that was my um, only comment uh, with regards to the first set of slides, but uh, let's continue with this. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thanks, Desiree, and thanks. Um, I thought you were online because you are also online in the room, <laughs> so that's why I wanted to give you the floor online, but you are both. You, you, you manage ubiquity, so congratulations, Desiree, uh, for that. Um, <laughs> no, yes, maybe um, let, let me finish that, that round, and then I, I'll go back to the, the question you, you had, and I think it's a very important one for the, for the future, because indeed um, there is a, a lot of feedback on that that, that we had. Um, so, um, on, on the European level, the question we had and the Commission um, asked to the citizens what was what visions, principles and actions should guide the development of desirable and fair virtual worlds. Uh, and we had them work a couple of weekends um, and give some recommendation to the Commission. And if, yes, and then at the end, the output of that process was a communication from the Commission uh, about uh, what they called Web 4. So, um, Desiree, you wanted to talk about Web 3. We are with the Commission, we are already at Web 4 um, about virtual worlds. Um, and this is very long, so do, do not, you don't need to read it, but it's part of the official communication of the communication. Um, and what is interesting is that they um, specifically mention the Citizens Panel as being the um, inspiration for that for their legislation. So here, in terms of impact of such a citizen dialogue and the continuation of it, we can see what it can become. Uh, if you look at the last paragraph, uh, the European Commission um, says the citizens panel specified a set of guiding principles for desirable virtual worlds. And then they just list the values that the citizens had developed during the, the citizens panel. What I want to say with that is um, in 2020, we had a more bottom-up uh, open approach uh, trying to have impact on policymaking. The example we I just showed here in 2022, 2023 was more top-down uh, approach from a policy uh, making body asking citizens, uh, ordinary citizens. So you have really to imagine that the people that came to Brussels to take part to that panel were not experts, not stakeholders of internet, they had no clue about what metaverse is. They didn't know the world. They didn't know about virtual worlds. But they took the time, they were guided, and they were able to give recommendations and give the, the guiding principle, principles they saw as important for the development of such a world. And with that, I would like to, to close the, 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 the presentation saying, OK, um, what now? Yes, maybe the next one. So now. Um, when you have heard that, and, but we, we first can have a, a discussion or we can have a, an, an open discussion in, in the time we, we, we have, but the, our um, motivation also to have that um, tonal meeting uh, with all the partners is to imagine 
what um, could be the, the future of such a dialogue? What could be a new version of it? Because we are still convinced, and here I look at uh, uh, Rashi, Roberto and, and other partners, uh, I think we are still convinced that we need that input from ordinary citizens for the global discussion on those topics. So what could be the, the topic? And here I also would like to, to connect back to Desiree what you were commenting, is because what you said indeed, we, we asked in 2020, we asked them what, what should be the level of governance. So that was a, a framing um, to understand if they saw more global governance or local governance. And now if we want to be more granular, as you said, we also should be able to understand should the topic be the same at global level or adapted to the context. So I think it's exactly what you were starting to, to explore, Desiree, is if we were to talk about um, a global dialogue on um, AI and, and metaverses, uh, how should, should the topic be done and should it be a common topic for everyone or more a local topic? And that's the discussion we wanted to, to have with you. But I give the floor to uh, Roberto, to Rashi, to first comment on the presentation and um, introduce that discussion. Excellent, Antoine. We will manage to receive uh, participants' participation now. Uh, if you agree, now we are asking you if you can have a, an answer for these questions about first the topic that you think will be relevant to discuss regarding AI, artificial intelligence, and then if it needs to be uh, to have a context in the in the country that we develop the dialogue. So those are the questions, please. I, I can reflect on a bit on the dialogue that we had in India. Um, we did have a very interesting discussion, and although uh, a lot of people were not particularly subject matter expertise, uh, I liked how we were looking at a very diverse age group. So we had uh, participation from a Buddhist monk uh, to housewives among, among the 50s. Uh, we also uh, picked up participants from uh, places where there is a lot of turmoil and angst. Uh, and I mean, I also come from a country which historically has the largest number of internet shutdowns. So internet connectivity is sparse or there has been internet shutdown for political reasons or otherwise. Um, so what came out from those conversations is that people do have a lot to say and if you provide them with information that is concrete, that has the right data, um, we need to give them agency to be able to make their own decisions. But in short, it was a very good educational exercise mm -hmm. um, for people to understand. And people are, no matter what age, um, people are always going to be keen uh, to participate um, and say what they have to say. So yes, from that point of view, I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the discussion as it was more of a literacy exercise, which is something we all need. Great, we do have some participation now for the audience, please. Thank you, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Katarzyna Stetiva, I represent the Polish National Research Institute and uh, in terms of uh, global dialogue on AI and what should be the main topics, I would definitely recommend uh, child protection, child uh, uh, online safety, because uh, it's a global it's a global both phenomenon and problem that uh, there are many harms to children uh, caused in the online environment, and uh, digital artifacts uh, are also stored online. Of what happening, uh, of, of what has happened to children, so um, AI can serve both uh, as uh, as a tool to help in terms of, uh, for example, finding uh, child abusive materials in the big uh, pail of uh, either photos or videos, and uh, it can do a lot of harm if you imagine um, digitally uh, created material. Uh, such as uh, child sexual abuse material, including uh, visual appearance of an existing child. So we have different sides of the problem, but I believe that uh, this is the topic that should be discussed both uh, at the global and at the local level. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, that, that makes a lot of sense when it comes to talking about um, AI being used for, you said, content related to harms because it's 
uh, easier given that content moderators and the way they've been treated uh, when it comes to their living wages or when it comes to looking at heinous content, um, kind of, I would say, contracting that to AI that could be more precise uh, could also help in sifting through large volumes of data given that so many people have come in online after COVID. So yes, definitely AI would be a good application and tool there. Okay. Yes, please. Um, um, Morton, you and you, Igav, just to follow on that note, I, I agree with that, but it comes back to also some of the survey results earlier, to a classical theme. It depends on the type of AI we're talking about. Is it AI like ChatGPT that students are using or we're using for research or is used by students to you know, cheat the teacher and, and skip, where learning, uh, skip learning experiences? Is it fake imagery? Is it fake news? So it comes back to this classical skill of not just having access, but also the critical skills and thinking about what you consume online, particularly when we're looking at deep fakes and the like. Uh, ChatGPT, there was an interesting study done, I think it was Oxford or MIT, on law students. And they actually found that poor perform, poorer performing law students, this is bachelor level law, uh, using tools like ChatGPT actually increased their performance whereas top performance students dropped in performance because they were leaving things too late. Yeah? So they started not being as creatively thinking about things as before. And these are university gr graduates. Um, so, so there are these differentiations I think we need to make and it comes back to walking into AI but also the metaverse and, and virtual realities with open eyes and with critical minds because there are pros and cons to these technologies. ChatGPT scrapes the internet and makes a proposal based on what are the most loud, what are the loudest voices there, and if those loud voices are fake news or, or false information, well, that's the output. And if you don't double check as the consumer of these things, then we are in a dangerous situation. But again, on the back end use cases, to identify fake news, racist and uh, discriminatory use, uh, et cetera, et cetera, even copyright infringements. There's a lot of abilities there, but there's still all the classical dialogues and who are in charge of the algorithms. We've seen there's been a lot of bias in Im image recognition and, and so forth. So how is that gonna come into this debate? And again, I think that starting with an educated learning and ensuring that we all critically assess what we consume and check alternative sources is part of that solution, not just regulation or fear of using the technology. Correct. Yes. Um, please, if another. anyone would like to uh, share also in online participants, please, you can uh, raise your hands so we can allow you the mic, please. We have several participants online, so you're invited to. But we have here another comment, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I think what I need to say here is to appreciate the responses after the, qu the question that I've asked in terms of what is it that I would want AI to respond on. And it was uh, dealt with in depth from the issue of demographics, from the issue of public participation, because of at times people, they don't think when we speak AI, you need to bring everybody along. People would speak about specific uh, 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 specialists. And I'm happy that now it is clear that in, it, when you speak about anything that speaks about transformation, you need to have a public participation. But I'm happy as well that in some of our pa by participant uh, it comes out loud to say there's a need of uh, continuous civic education in terms of AI. And I think what we need to do is not to shy away from the fact that AI governance, it is important, mm -hmm. so that you deal with the issue of command and control, that nobody can just spread anything that has to do with any news so that you deal with uh, misinformation and, and fake news. So it is important that AI is, 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 is governed properly well. And as well, I think that the issue of uniformity 
irrespective of where you are nationally, locally, it's something else. But having a uniformed approach in terms of uh, digitalization and AI, it is important. N not forgetting the fact that we all have different languages, but the content must not change. Because one of the things that makes us uh, not to be in par in terms of developmental uh, uh, issues or studies, it is on the basis that when you come to when you come from Af uh, America and I come from South Africa, our standards are not the same and the contents change based on the issue of the country. But if we can agree that when we speak on the issue of uh, artificial intelligence, we must remain in, in terms of the same content, I, I think we would deal with uh, many issues that might affect uh, progress in terms of uh, for IRF revolution. Thank you. Thanks. I think Dusty also had. So that comments. will be a hybrid approach, meaning that we need to agree on general terms independently of the country, but to adapt somehow a particular topic inside. Okay, great. Anyone else in the room, please? Yes, that Dusty had a few comments. Or online? I have no, no question, uh, no, no, no feedback online, and um, so for the moment, no. Maybe we have another comment, please. Is that the... Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to follow up of what, um, on what the previous um, participant um, commented on uh, the, you know, the number of solutions. Perhaps it led to that as well. Whether one of the questions uh, one should be asking is what kind of uh, AI implementation should it be? And as it's been mentioned earlier on, at the moment there is like a plethora of many models of AI being developed, not just the chat GBT, but also the training data sets are being developed. And uh, there is, uh, you know, different kind of open source AI models, as we have heard in the main session, um, the father mm -hmm. of internet supporting the open source um, open sourcing uh, some of these uh, models, AI models that are being developed. Um, but in that light, I also wanted to um, uh, say that it's important when we present these choices to people who are not expert in the fields to also always give them some kind of understanding in trade-offs. So for example, uh, maybe one example would be, you know, there could be an offset if only too few companies end up being the owners of the best data sets and having the more powerful um, AI algorithms. Um, algorithms. And on the other hand, um, open source could make many more models, but it comes down to many other things like the size of the data set, whether it's biased. If you do a search for who are the CEOs of hospitals in the world, it's always a man. Is it true? No, it's the wrong data set. And it's not easy to fix that code in a line to say there are CEOs of hospitals in the world that are not only men, um, just a plastic example. Um, but uh, with um, the thought of whether it should be proprietary or open source AI models or training data sets, which are now more and more available, I think it's also important to um, think about the guardrails that are built into some of these big proprietary models. That means there should be not allowed hate speech or, you know, they have these uh, uh, cons uh, uh, kind of constraints that are built in that are good in, in this, uh, so you can control maybe easier, regulate fewer uh, of these uh, instances of AI, whether they chat GPT or something else. Um, and on the other hand, open source, we think we would not be bound to just use a couple of these models. So there are these certain trade-offs that in open source, it's not open source unless you can modify. So you can, for example, modify that you allow hate speech. <laughs> um, and then we ask ourselves, is this really artificial intelligence that is simulating human intelligence? If it's intelligent, it should not be uh, really suggesting um, um, 
propagation of hate speech and, and so on. And um, then there's a set of copyright issues as well. Uh, so there are all these uh, you know, questions that we could um, work on um, because there is a rapidly growing set of developers that are making sustainable AI models and um, different kind of chat GPTs. So, yes, uh, true. Thank you. Thank you very much. One last round, if anyone, please. Mm. Yes, there is one comment. Um, thank you for a very inspiring um, pre uh, presentation and comments. Uh, I'm Amy from Japan. Um, I'm working uh, for a, a private company right now, but involving educational arena as well um, to provide reliable information from um, um, uh, global gov uh, governments, uh, various governments. Um, I, I really understood uh, the participatory process is crucial in this uh, topic, and, um, and, and now I have one new question that um, uh, the developers should be involved uh, in such participatory process in order to, I, I feel like um, educating citizens as well as educating uh, developers uh, maybe educating the wording is not uh, re really what I mean, but uh, uh, to understand the th um, the concerns and also to understand uh, uh, the front front line problem is beneficial for both of us. So I I feel um, uh, you know understanding and educating and learning from both of, both of the field is very important and if. I, uh, so, so far, I don't know such um, uh, cases, so um, yeah, I, I, I have my desire to know more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And indeed, um, a very Maybe. important part of the yeah. dialogues will, will include the, I mean, not only the developers, but all the technical community that will be related to AI. It's very important that, so thank you for that comment as well. There was another if comment I that I also wanted rushing? to make in terms of um, people Roberto, talk about can yes. I make a comment? Sure, it's from uh, yeah, yeah, it's from Philippa Smith, right? Yeah, I'm just wondering whether a worthwhile question might tackle digital divides and how this might impact on the understanding and use of AI from a global perspective. How can a global dialogue assist countries to support um, each other to overcome barriers so that there might be a balance in understanding and use of AI and metaverses? That's a question that I mean, AI, AI is. is a tool to help with the dialogue which has low connectivity, is that the question? How can, that, how, how can this, this dialogue can support to overcome barriers so that there might be a balance in understanding and use of AI and metaverses. So how the dialogue contributes to this. You want to take that one, Antoine? Yes, thanks. But before that, I wanted to, to make a, a comment on Amy's um, question um, sure. about developers. Um, and I think it's, it's really, really important indeed. And that's something we need to, to, to extend the, the scope of uh, that kind of dialogue uh, because they, they are part of the, the solution uh, and the challenge. <laughs> and maybe one example of something we, we managed to do in 2015, uh, we had such a dialogue at global level on the climate uh, agreement in Paris. So the same principle all over the world, groups of citizens and, and the question about the Paris agreement information materials on that and discussed and gave their, their opinion. And in parallel to that, we did one process with employees from NG. And you may know NG is one of the big, big um, energy company at global level. And we had a process for their employees. So we had uh, thousands and thousands of employees from NG taking part in the same exact same dialogue as the citizens. And so the, the interesting part was they were as citizens, but also employees and stakeholders of an energy company. 
So it was very interesting to see that they had that double hat. I work for an energy company, but I am a citizen. <laughs> and it was a very interesting thing. So, so thank you for, for reminding that indeed, having developers, having uh, people that, that do also the technology is very important to address them, not only as in their job, but also as citizens in such a process. So I think it's, it, uh, yeah, thank you for, for, for that comment. Um, I, I then also... we have a clarification from Philippa, I see, um, about the, okay, and I don't know if you see it, Roberto, but she says, uh, whole countries that are more capable can assist authors that might have issues through a dialogue. Um, and, and so how can the dialogue assist the, the learning and the mutual learning of different uh, countries with different capacity? We, we did that, that in India in some places. We did two dialogues in places that are more remote where I, I wouldn't say that the internet penetration is low, but generally talking about digital literacy or these or these topics are usually not approached. And we those were uh, the dialogues uh, happened during uh, the peak pandemic period. So we did have two in-person dialogues in small village settings where we trained uh, a lot of journalists to be able to lie with and get outputs. Um, and we realized that the format that we had might not have been the best. Uh, we might need a better way of contextualizing that information. We did localize it in terms of translating it into the local languages. India has a lot of languages, but we feel like maybe a, a more storytelling format with a few UI and UX experts testing out different ways to be able to evoke responses because that's not, this not something that they're used to. Um, people are not used to talking that long and pondering about those topics. So maybe there needs more time, but yes, that there was something that was tried, and I'm sure there are other, other examples across the world uh, that would have also worked. But also to coming back to the question of developers, yes, developers uh, need to be actually central to conversations like this to have, uh, I would say, a more conscious and moralistic bent to this. Um, at the end of the day, they're humans, and also to also for all of us to reflect and see that all of these issues that we talk about, hate speech or misinformation, they're not new phenomena that have been there because of the advent of technology. They've always been there. Um, they've always had different modes. Um, sometimes you've had uh, more expensive infrastructure to be able to enable these phenomena. Uh, but now you use technology, which has made it more economical and cheaper and easier to um, you know, spread propaganda. Uh, but yes, um, developers should be at the center of the conversation. Thank you for highlighting that. Yes, maybe a follow-up about question from Philippe after she clarified about this. Uh, yeah, we agree. It's, mm, she, she wasn't uh, uh, taken as a, as a tool. And this, uh, we, we need to remember that this process is initially or mainly locally. So it's between the citizens of each of our countries. But I will say, I don't know what you think, uh, Antoine, but maybe after we, uh, as part of the results of the dialogues, we gather all the results, all the conclusions in each of the dialogues, we can have a sort of a round between coordinators of each of the countries to comment and maybe to identify which are the common topics as priorities that could be uh, presented in the different instances that we need to share the reports, something like that. In that way, I think we could accomplish what it was suggested and to actually um, have as a return this assist, this, this support coming from the, from the countries that have more experience maybe in particular topics, assisting some others that don't. So maybe that could be a good idea. What do you think, Antoine? Yeah, uh, that uh, that would be fantastic. And and if I dream a bit, the the next, of course, the next piece would be to invite ambassadors from each country, from the participating citizens, to gather at at a global level to also reflect on their own results. And I think, but that that needs a, a stronger infrastructure for the for the dialogue. But I think that would be fantastic to to have that that step. 
um, and, and to be able to, to aggregate at different levels those results. Because I think that's um, one of the, the key that it's very qualitative uh, data. So it has the, the advantage of, of um, being that you can search a lot into it and, and understand why people say what they say. Um, but at the same time, it's the challenge because indeed you have to analyze it. Um, and, and maybe uh, it's where artificial intelligence can help indeed <laughs> make sense of the data we the citizens produce through such a dialogue because until now the the analysis was uh, human uh, made and and so maybe there is a full circle here uh, to have AI help us understand what people say about AI um, and that would be a, a nice a nice way to 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 have a circle and a connection uh, between AI and citizens' dialogues. Um, uh, it's um, two for, to the hour, so I think we, we, we can conclude if I, if, if I get we it right. So, no. from we have the one audience question from the audience here. At yes. Mark. OK, but I don't know the, the time, so I, I let you in, in the room get the, the last round of questions. Yeah, the good thing is that we have the uh, lunch after this, so we can have a, a license to extend a little bit. Okay. Please, Mark. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, Mark Carvel, Internet Governance uh, Consultant. I was previously with the UK government. And uh, it's not a question, really, but it's just a point of information. And it may have cropped up earlier because I arrived late for this session uh, from, from the, uh, the main uh, plenary session on the, on the Global Digital Compact. But... Um, I know from my uh, association with um, uh, Project Liberty, McCourt Institute, who, that they are participating in a focus group on metaverses at the ITU. And there are a number of working groups at the ITU on metaverses. And I think that uh, is potentially a channel for um, contributing to the citizens' uh, aspects of this uh, evolution of uh, the convergence of immersive technologies with internet technologies that's going to be so transformative um, into those into those discussions. I think, from what I understand, that they are valuable, quite wide-ranging, and uh, uh, I mean Project Liberty's particular interest is on decentralizing mm. these technology platforms, on ensuring that they are profitably uh, properly respectful of ethics and rights and so on. So uh, I offer that as a piece of information for yes. the conclusion here. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. It, it, it really helps. Actually, uh, uh, we were talking about AI during the whole session, but of course it wasn't like just that, but also some other emerging technologies like the metaverse. So thank you very much, Mark, for that. I think we're getting to the final moment of the session. And uh, if we don't any other comment, maybe we can wrap up. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, but I do believe we have one person. Sure. Maybe I'll just take a room around and see if there's anyone who has any last comments. Anyone at all? Anyone else wants to go? Uh, can, you, can you give her the mic, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for for giving me this opportunity to final uh, to to provide you with a final comment. A lot has been said on um, inclusion of developers and uh, society and so on, but I do believe that it's a strongly interdisciplinary issue. So there must be a place for every single specialist who has something to say, and by this I'm relating to the metaverse uh, and. Uh, instances of because you know uh, I, I originate from child protection environment uh, so we have to benefit from what we know from the past and the research and we have to check what is going on now so we need to make a bridge between the past the present uh, and we need to listen to experts uh, and specialists such as uh, again developers sexologists uh, practitioners uh, policy makers, so it's a common responsibility, I would say, and by not including an expert of a particular field, we may simply overlook an important contribution, so um, there is really, um, I think this room is a good example, mm -hmm. that there are many people from different uh, environments, different angles, uh, 
and we learn from each other, and this is the only way to, to proceed. Thank you. Correct, correct, yes. And of course the learners, the teachers, and also not necessarily experts in a field, but also users of the technology. Okay. Maybe there was one last comment that I also wanted to mention that we talk about children, there are other vulnerable groups like people with disabilities who should also be taken into account uh, and also of course different languages. And then yes, we can go on and on. Yes. Uh, I do feel <laughs> we should come to a halt. We don't want to take away anyone's lunchtime, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, and yes, uh, Roberto and I are going to be around at the IGF. Um, happy to take more questions, happy to have more discussions. Um, and yeah, with this, uh, we come to a close. Thank you. Yes, if you want, um, I don't know, maybe Antoine would like to say goodbye as well. Maybe just one, so the, the really thank you for being there. Um, but one thing is our intention is to not stop involving citizens into those discussions. So if you're interested in, in joining us in, in that effort of thinking about it and making it happen, uh, we are open <laughs> and mm -hmm. we would love to discuss with you on how to do that together. I think that's Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.